Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we believe that you inspired your servant Luke to record these words in Acts chapter 2, and that these words not only had power in the day that Luke wrote them, but these words have power today because they're inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so we pray, come Holy Spirit afresh upon your church, that we may hear, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest this holy word and be changed more and more to be like Jesus for the sake of the world, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Today we celebrate Pentecost. Today we celebrate the giving of the Holy Spirit, the coming of the wind of heaven, the fire of God. Today we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. So church, where is he? Where's the Spirit today? Where's the fire of God in the church today in your life and in mine? You know, when we moved to Plano six years ago, our house came with two fireplaces. We'd never had two fireplaces, but these fireplaces were different. These ones we'd never seen before in our lives, they were plumbed for gas. But it appeared that the two fireplaces plumbed for gas, some previous tenant had taken all the hardware out. So I was instantly terrified. I mean, as most of us are about gas leaks. And I just said to the family, the fireplaces are off limits. You don't touch the fireplace. You don't put anything in the fireplaces. Two beautiful fireplaces, never a fire in them. Do you sometimes feel that your relationship with the Holy Spirit is like those fireplaces? that you've been built by God. You know you've been built by God to contain and hold fire. But where's the fire? Do you know by reading scripture that you have been fit to have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit live in you, but often it feels like where is that spirit? We can feel like those fireplaces, can't we? Well, there's good news on this Pentecost. Because when we look at these texts, both our texts from Acts chapter 2 and Romans chapter 14, we see incredible good news for Christians about the reality and the presence of the Holy Spirit, the fire of God in your life now. If you are a Christian, just in case you fall asleep now, here's the punchline. If you are a Christian, if you can say Jesus is Lord, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. We'll explain that the promise is yours. And if you're not a believer, if you're not yet a Christian, the promise is for you too. As Peter will say on the end of his Pentecost day sermon in Acts chapter 2, verse 39, the promise is not just for you, but for your children and for all those who are afar off whom the Lord calls to himself. If he calls you to himself, the Holy Spirit is yours too. No matter how far off you may feel you are. That maybe is why you're here today, because he's drawing you to himself. See, what we need to understand about the Holy Spirit on this Pentecost, we need to understand that the Holy Spirit is not just about power. It's not just about the power of God. The Holy Spirit is about power in many ways, but it's not, he's not just about power. The Holy Spirit is a person, the third person of the Holy Trinity, a person, a distinct person within the Godhead who interacts with us as the other two persons in the Godhead will interact with us. He's not just power, he's a person. And here's the promise, that he's yours not because you earn him, not even because you feel him there, but he's yours because the father made a promise that he would pour his spirit into you. See, first we need to realize and remember that the Holy Spirit's not just power. 
I mean, it's easy to focus on the power of the Holy Spirit, that attribute of who he is, because we see through scripture so much power poured out through the Spirit. It's incredible. I mean, look at our text today, Acts chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Tongues as of fire appeared in that room, landed on each person's head, and they began to speak in other tongues or other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. I mean, you see examples of this again and again. The Spirit comes, and what's the result? Incredible power poured out. This is the empowering presence of God we've seen all the way from the beginning of the story of Scripture. This Spirit of God who's poured out on particular people at particular times, particular places for particular tasks, the empowering presence of God. And yet now, on the day of Pentecost, Verse 17 tells us in fulfillment of Joel chapter two, then the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall dream dreams and your old men shall see visions. Even on your male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall all prophesy. This is the power of God being poured out into every disciple, every member of the church on the day of Pentecost. The power of God. As we see there's scripture, this spirit of God who has the power to open a heart. A dead heart, if the spirit comes in, can make that heart alive and receive the gospel. The spirit that can open the word of God. Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that he's the spirit of revelation and wisdom. That he will in fact help us understand God's word. That's why we pray the way we do at the beginning of every sermon. Oh, come Holy Spirit, so that we may hear, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest. He can do that. He has the power to make even my mind understand the things of God. The Holy Spirit has the power to gift us. In the words of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, with these manifestations for each of us, manifestations of the Spirit, gifts, for the good of the whole church. The Holy Spirit has the power to guide us, as we'll see next week in John chapter 16, that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit has the power to work miracles in our own lives. Mighty deeds of God that can come through even the likes of us, and even the mightiest miracle of all, that the Holy Spirit has the power to mold you and me into the image of Jesus. What does Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 say? That the fruit of the Spirit is love, love, joy, peace, patience. Oh, how our world needs us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The Holy Spirit has that power to mold you and I into the image of Jesus. It's incredible the power he has. No wonder we so often focus on the power. I mean, when you see it operative in scripture and you see the Holy Spirit operative in his power today, you stand back and say, well, this is powerful. Remember Monica and I in Cambodia in 2016, we had been given a grant to go to Cambodia to teach biblical leadership principles in Cambodia and it was, the grant was structured so we had two different groups we'd work with. We'd work with a group of rural pastors and they were amazing. And we're off in the sticks and they're just so hungry for education and we had a wonderful few days with them. And then came into the city where then we were to, according to the grant, work with another group of people, a bunch of government workers, Cambodian government and nonprofit organizations. And many of them were not Christians. And I said, great, this is awesome. We have an opportunity to... You know, put the seeds of the gospel out there. But what happened with the second group was interesting is when we left the first group, one of the pastors followed us. And I didn't quite know culturally what to do with this. I thought, did he just forget to get off the bus or something? And he just showed up for the second set of meetings. And I thought, okay, he's going to get round two. But also what was difficult was you could tell that there was a class issue. Because all these government workers and these NGO leaders, they had lots of money and lots of status. And they wanted nothing to do with this very poor, very clearly poor pastor. I mean, he was on the side of the room. He'd sort of self, you know, restrict himself at meetings to stay away. It was just a weird environment until the final day 
Because I'm teaching all these government leaders and NGOs all about, you know, the Bible and, and, and you know how translation works. You've got to have a translator. Well, with the first group, I had a pastor translating, but the second group, I had one of these government leaders who spoke English translating, and he couldn't translate half of the theological terms that I kept using. He didn't know the Bible terms. And so I realized everything was breaking down, and finally that pastor, the shunned poor pastor in the corner, put up his hands and said, I can translate. And he got up and began translating, and we watched the room change. I mean, I mean supernaturally change. For those of you who've been in translation environments, um, you know, you'll, you'll say a little bit, and then the translator says a little bit, and then you say a little bit in the translator, and you kind of get in this pattern. Well, very quickly, I would say about this much, and then he'd talk for about five minutes. <laughs> and then I'd say a bit more, and then he'd go on for about five minutes. And what was amazing was how everyone in that room unbelievers among them were eating out of his hand. You saw the transformation of this man who was marginalized and scorned and put to the side in the power of the spirit transforming that room. The power from on high was so evident and present in that time together. I just stopped talking. Let him go and reach the nations of the spirit. We're told again and again we need to remember those words from 1 John chapter 4. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. We see the power of God. But again, we have to remember that though there's so much power outpoured in the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit, that's not the sum total of who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit's not just a power source to plug into when you need him. The Holy Spirit's a person a distinct person within the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And just as we relate to the other two persons of the Godhead, the Father and the Son, so are we to learn to relate personally to the Holy Spirit. You see in Scripture examples of how the Holy Spirit's personhood is put on display. We're told in Scripture that uh, the Holy Spirit can be grieved, can be lied to, and can speak to us, among other things. But I think the greatest place where we see a picture of the personhood of the Holy Spirit is our text today from John chapter 14. Because Jesus says something fascinating about the Holy Spirit. Listen carefully. In verse 16, Jesus talks about the paraclete. You might have heard that word before, paraclete. It can mean helper. It can mean comforter. It can mean um, advocate. It can mean battle partner. The one who comes along aside you. Right? So the Holy Spirit is being described as the paraclete, the helper, the comforter. But when Jesus talks about the coming of the Holy Spirit, he doesn't say, I will give you the paraclete. He says, I will give you another paraclete, another comforter, another helper. And you want to say, well, if it's another comforter, if it's another helper, if it's another paraclete, who's the first paraclete? Who's the first comforter? Who's the first helper? Well, the first paraclete Comforter, helper is Jesus. I've been your paraclete. I've been your comforter. I've been your helper. I've been your guide, Jesus is saying. And I'm sending another. And what Jesus does just in that tiny bit of grammar is explain to us that we're to understand the Holy Spirit in similar terms to the way we understand Jesus. I have been with you as your comforter, and he, like me, will be with you as well. In the same way, not in some abstract way, not in some ethereal way, but in a personal and relational way. This other paraclete, like Jesus, will exercise his own distinct personhood in your life. You don't just know Jesus personally. You, O oh Christian, are called to know the Holy Spirit personally. See, the reason we, I think, often don't focus enough on the person of the Holy Spirit, I mean, in the one sense, it's, it's hard to even get into Trinitarian understandings. That's why Father Jonathan, our cathedral theologian, will be preaching next Sunday on Trinity Sunday. So he can explain every question you've ever had about the Trinity. 20 minutes. I guarantee it. <laughs> it's difficult to understand how three persons can exist within one Godhead. The unity of three persons. But it's what we see through scripture and what we see the early church 
understand within the first few centuries with such clarity. But the reason also I think we often don't think of the Holy Spirit in his personhood is that whenever we talk about the Holy Spirit or think about the Holy Spirit, usually we get wrapped up in all the works, all the expressions, all your experiences of the Holy Spirit. Right? Isn't that true when you think about a conversation you have with other Christians? It often comes down to, are you charismatic? Are you a charismatic believer? Or are you a non-charismatic believer? By the way, there's no such thing as a non-charismatic believer. I'll come back to that. Are you a Holy Spirit-filled Christian? Or not a Holy Spirit-filled Christian? Again, that's not a thing. I'll get back to that. Have you been baptized a second time in the Holy Spirit? That's not a thing. The Holy Spirit must come in baptism and faith. Again, I'll get to that in a moment. The problem is so often we're tied up in our experiences of the Holy Spirit that we miss his personhood. And let me just make a quick note though, because I'm sure I offended some people in the room just a moment ago. Not the last time. (laughs) Anglicanism has a wide breadth. I mean, some of you maybe need to hear from me today. Maybe you've been here for a while and wondered, am I allowed to be a little more expressive in worship? Maybe you come out of a bit of a happy clappy, raise your hands, more charismatic kind of church experience. And you wonder, I doesn't really feel like I can do that in the Anglican tradition. The Anglican tradition is wide and broad. I mean, trust me, come with me to Rwanda or Singapore and I'll show you the breadth of Anglican worship. The problem is that for us so often we focus on the experience of the Spirit, the feel of the Spirit rather than talking about the person. I remember my very first experience at an Anglican church in North America Synod, just to give you a sense of the breadth of Anglicanism when it comes to understanding and expression. There's wide expression. You are welcome to express yourself in worship within the Anglican tradition. I remember going into our very first synod, national gathering. We had three bishops present, all from very different perspectives within the Anglican sort of world as far as Holy Spirit, all Orthodox biblical Christians. And they said at the end of the service, who wants to come up for prayer? And everybody got up. I mean, we were in prayer lines for two hours. So they had just three lines, one bishop here, one bishop here, one bishop here. And you just kind of got stuck in the line closest to wherever you were. And I watched the Anglo-Catholic bishop over here, the more traditionalists, you know, the Anglo-Catholic, more high church, Smells and bells, more lace, more grace. Okay, so there was Bishop Don Harvey, our Anglo Catholic bishop. People were coming up, and he had his oil, and he'd anoint them, and he had this beautiful collect out of the prayer book. He prayed over them, and you could see people having a profound encounter with the Holy Spirit in that style and expression. And then in the middle, there was Bishop Greg Venables from Argentina, old school evangelical, low, low church, can't can't find his collar most days, doesn't even want to wear it, like that kind of low church. He's sitting there, doesn't have his oil, doesn't have his prayer book, he probably doesn't know where they are, but he's got his Bible, and everyone comes up, and he puts his hand on their shoulder, and he flips to a different place in the Bible, and reads a passage of scripture over their lives. Profound, Holy Spirit encounter, right there. And then Malcolm Harding, dear Bishop Malcolm, who had a recognized healing ministry, charismatic, no oil, no prayer book, just put his hands on people's heads. And I watched about every two or three of the people who went up there, just falling down, slain in the spirit. I wanted to go to every one of those lines. Each one of these, a legitimate expression of how we live into this belief in the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. But if we focus on the expression, we end up dividing ourselves and we miss the person. Do we look at the Holy Spirit programmatically or personally? I mean, do you look at the Holy Spirit and your relationship with the Holy Spirit as what can I get out of the Holy Spirit or what can the Holy Spirit do for me? Or do you look at the Holy Spirit personally and ask, who is the Holy Spirit to me? Do you look at the Holy Spirit as a relationship that you want to utilize? 
plug in, get some power out of? Or do you look at the Holy Spirit as one you want to understand? Do you come to him for his works? Or do you come to him to be with him? Because he's with you. You know, it's interesting in Romans 8, Paul, who understood the incredible power of the Holy Spirit working in his life and the life of the church. Romans chapter 8, one of the high points, I'd argue, in all of Paul's writings, all about the work of the Spirit, doesn't talk much about the fireworks. Doesn't talk much about all the expressions of the Spirit. Do you know what he talks about in Romans 8? Verse 16, that the Holy Spirit tells you who you are. The Spirit speaks to our spirit, telling us that we're children of God. That's about just being with a person, sitting with him and letting him tell you, do you know who you are? You're a child of God. Verse 26, the Spirit teaches us how to pray. For we're told in verse 26 that we, in our weakness, don't know how to pray. But the Spirit intercedes for us. He becomes our prayer partner teaching us how to do this thing called prayer. These are the quiet disciplines, not just the big explosive ones. This is the person of the Holy Spirit coming alongside us. Like other relationships in our lives, do we take time to talk to the Spirit, to listen to the Spirit, to allow the Spirit to do his quiet work with us, just to be with him, to know that he will never leave us or forsake us. See, he's not just power. The Holy Spirit is a person. Unless you still worry because you don't feel it, he's with you because he's promised to be there. I love how Acts chapter two begins. Verse one, Luke is a master storyteller. He says, verse one, they, the disciples, were all together in one place on the day of Pentecost. He says nothing else. There's no other setup. We have no idea what they're doing. Nothing remarkable to talk about. Nothing noteworthy. He doesn't mention if they're studying. He doesn't mention if they're praying. Nothing. They're just kind of sitting there. And that's Luke's point because the real action starts in verse two. With the church doing nothing, earning nothing, not even asking, verse two, suddenly, the sound of a wind from heaven filled the room. And tongues as a fire appeared before them and rested on each one of them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came to them unasked, uninvited, certainly unearned, but he came. And that's the way he always comes. He always comes this way because we cannot prompt his coming. We can't beg for it. It is a gift that comes because of a promise. Jesus says in the end of Luke 24, he calls the Holy Spirit the promise of the Father. In Acts chapter one, verse four, again, I will send the promise of the Father. The promise is this, that from the foundation of the world, that when the Son of God would have come to earth, born the flesh of man and woman, flesh of man, died on the cross for our sins, buried in the ground, gone to hell in our place, overcome the gates of hell and death and Satan, risen again and now ascended into heaven in victory, that at that point from the foundation of creation, there was a promise that then the spirit would be poured out. It was a promise. I remember when our kids were little, we were so careful with our kids not to use the word I promise. Oh, they would use it against you. You promised. We just stripped it from our vocabulary but the father can use it. Your father in heaven can use that word because he keeps his promises. The spirit comes not because you've earned the spirit or because you're ready for the spirit, but because you by grace through faith have become a Christian, a Christ follower, a child of God. That's the promise. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse three, we're told that no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. That means when you feel empty, when you feel the Spirit is not blowing, when you feel like there's a great absence, ask yourself this question. You want assurance? It's found here. 
Are you a Christian? Do you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If the answer is yes, the Spirit is there because it's a promise. And again, as I said earlier, if you're a non-believer, not quite even sure why you might be here this morning, it's because the promise of the Spirit is for you too. That would you come as he calls you and draws you to himself by his Spirit, that the Spirit will be poured into you as well. The promise is for you and for your children and for all those the Lord draws to himself. You know, this promise is something we need to remember. It's part of the reason I love being an Anglican, not just because of the breadth of Anglican expression. That's, that's beautiful. But also because of our liturgy. Our liturgy is a constant reminder of the promise of God about the Holy Spirit's person and power in our lives. You know, as we come into our liturgies, if we've got ears to hear, the Holy Spirit is just everywhere in our liturgies to remind us. Like, you notice when we pray, we say our colics. People sometimes say, oh, you Anglicans, every time you say a prayer, you've always got to end it in the Trinitarian formula. You know, we say a prayer and then, you know, through Jesus Christ and the unity of the Holy Spirit and the glory of the Father, you think, man, that's pedantic. It's not pedantic, it's pedagogy. It's teaching you again and again the promise of God. Every time we pray, the Holy Spirit is built into that prayer. When we come to baptism in our liturgy, the high point of the liturgy, the water is poured on in the Trinitarian formula. But then with oil we say on the forehead, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. When you come for confirmation and the bishop sits before you and you kneel before the bishop and he's wearing that hat on his head and no, it's not a crown. Look at the bishop's hat next time. It's a tongue of fire. It's a picture of the apostolic lineage that goes all the way back to the day of Pentecost the Holy Spirit for you would be poured on again. And what does he say in your confirmation? That you would be filled with the Spirit more and more. And finally, every week as we gather for communion, not only as we come in and begin with our colic for purity, that the inspiration of the Holy Spirit would transform and prepare our hearts, but as we put bread and wine on this holy table, it is in prayer by word and the Holy Spirit that these mere elements become bread from heaven and the cup of salvation for us. Every time we gather, the Holy Spirit and his promise is right in front of us. Give us, O oh Lord, ears to hear. I always tell my friends, Anglicans are charismatics. We're just liturgical charismatics. So do you ever feel, as a Christian, like those fireplaces. Those fireplaces in my house, built and fit to contain fire, but sometimes wondering where's the fire. Built and fit to hold the very Spirit of God, but where's the Spirit? Well, you know, the interesting thing about the story is a few years later, Monica decided for her birthday she wanted us to finally get fire in the fireplace. And she said, could for my birthday, we actually get the fireplaces fitted up? I said, okay. So I called up the technician to come in and do the plumbing. And I called him and I said, I, you know, listen, everything's been torn out of this thing. Like, I'm sure it's gonna be really expensive. And I said, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I said, are you a Christian? I'm clergy. You know, I'm wondering if there might be you know, a little bit of a discount. And he said, let me just come and take a look. Let me come and take a look. Because, of course, I didn't have a clue about any of this stuff. And he walked into our house, and within one minute, he said, there's nothing missing. There's no plumbing missing. It's all still exactly plumbed and ready to go. You need to put a couple gas logs in there and turn the key on and light it, and it... <laughs> Four years, and the thing worked. That's the truth of our lives. Even when we think he's gone, even when we think we're empty, even when we think we're completely without spirit and without fire, if you're a Christian, he hasn't gone anywhere. 
Today is the celebration of Pentecost. Today, we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit, the wind from heaven, the fire of God. Where is he today? Where is the Holy Spirit? Where is the fire? He's right here. He's right here. Right here. And he's in someone's phone as well right now, but he's right here. (laughs) For as John 14 tells us, verse 17, the Holy Spirit, you'll know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you because it's a promise. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.